What's going on guys, what's cracking? Got the MR2 up there right now, trying to fix some electrical issues right now. Uh, for some reason, this fog light here does not want to turn on. So I've been starting to test with my test light here, going through everything, went and checked the fuse, power to the fuse. Check the relay, power to the relay. Put power down or check the uh, actual connector here for the fog light itself, no power. So I'm getting underneath the car here and tr back tracing the wiring and seeing where it could possibly be failing. Is it actually failing at the connector? Is there other wiring it's going to? It's been spliced into and not working. So that's what I'm trying to look into right now. The thing is though, oh, look, what's up buddy? What's going on? If I go inside the car here, which is kind of crooked right now as the door goes down, um, I can turn the lights on, everything works. One thing that's always been weird with this car is it has a switch here for the fog lights, right? Okay, that switch has always been there. Doesn't do shit, doesn't turn anything on, doesn't turn anything off. So I think these fog lights were an afterthought or something happened, someone modified something over the years. I don't know what, so I wanna try and backtrace some of this wiring and see what could be possibly causing this because it's been driving me crazy for quite some time. All right guys, here, uh, guess who's here again? Let me get a second. We got BB here. And uh, I was looking at electrical, but of course, as I'm eating, he can't wait, and he's like, I gotta tear into this. Look at him. Look at the man go. So what'd you find already? So it turns out that they disconnected the factory fog light harness and hardwired it into the turn signal so that the fog light would constantly run, whether you're on a high beam or low beam setting. And uh, over time, this connector, whether it took a toll on the wire and just shot it out that's so weird that it happened well that's cool so do we need to get a new connector for that like i've never spliced something like that you know how i do a janky way of splicing where you literally splice the wires and twist them together and do that the ryan scott way we'll we'll figure something out here all right cool all right so we got bb here reaching his arm through he's twisting the wires together right now just to test to make sure this new fix will work because like i said before inside the car here this switch down here has never worked ever doesn't do shit. Well, it's because they hardwired it in to bypass for the high beams, right? So we're gonna try and rewire it up so that doesn't matter and actually works via the switch because I never even turned my high beams on and I would run, I want it back to factory. I don't want any of this janky stuff done. So we're gonna try and fix all that. And uh, thank you again, BB. Well, you see, such a nice guy. Oh, and Stats Racing, what's good? Look at that. Such a cool hoodie slash t-shirt. Support your boy and I love that. F my 401k. All right, guys, so. We're still fighting with this. We're finding a few more issues and errors, but while that's going on, uh, I also need to install this strut tower bar. This is a strut tower I had on the car, God, years ago. I've actually got cutouts already in the plastic to make it look seamless, if you guys can see there. I actually cut out the rear trunk plastics there so it sits underneath, so there's a screw right here and bolt right there. You pop that up and then uh, I just have to unbolt. There's three bolts, I think, total, and this pops up then. So pretty freaking easy, but let's go ahead and start taking this apart. All right, guys, see, once you pop those covers off, there's a total of three bolts, or three nuts, I should say, and you gotta take those three nuts off, and then you gotta slip on the blue covers first, so take these off on each side, and I'll show you how you have to put on the covers, or the, I guess, the parts where it bolts together. All right, guys, so I got the bar back in, as you guys can see there, these bolt it down in over here. Uh, it has to slip back behind all this plastic and shit. That one bolt back there kind of sucks to get to, but it's not too terrible. The reason I had it out, especially when it comes to cruise here, I'll probably take it back out, was the fact that when that's on, you can't get to the fuel tank. And I'm glad I took it out because last year, not last year, two years ago, went to cruise week and somehow the fuel pump disconnected itself and I needed to get down there. If I would've had this on, I'd been fucked because of some of these tools, like the ends for this side, like I wouldn't have been able to get this off. So yeah, but now I'm just gonna put the plastic, backs on, plastic back on and uh, then we're gonna work on the electrical that BB has now figured out. As I'm holding the camera close because I do have the heater on right now. We were able to fix the MR2 fog lights. Um, they do work now. Problem was with them, the wiring was so janky and so messed up and I'm like, right now if I go inside and I flick on the fog light switch, it actually turns the high beams on and off. No idea why, we went through the wiring and actually had all the factory wiring there. We started looking up online, apparently these things are really finicky as it is, and a lot of guys like them to run all the time, so whoever had before had cut the wire and had them set up so if you turn your high beams on, your fog lights don't turn off. By law, your fog lights have to turn off when your high beams are on. No idea why that is and this, why this individual wanted that, I have no idea, but they did do that. 
We tried to get it to work at the factory one, but we were causing more issues, so we said screw it. Fixed all the wiring, did all the connections right, but they are steadily on whenever you turn the headlights on, whether they're high beam or low beam, but they do work now, so I'm happy about that. But now we've got a new problem that just came up today, and I'm throwing it in this video now. So I was driving the car, it was awesome, and it started to sound like a tractor. So I get over to my friend Kyle's house, and I'm like, oh, let me get under it here. Let's see if we can find anything. If you guys can see there, that's the gasket. So one of the bolts must have fallen out, or something must have happened, but yeah, the gasket came undone somehow, some way. Not sure how that happened, but it did. So I'm gonna get this up in the air here, guys, and see how the hell the bolt fell out. As you can see this brand new bolt, I just put that in. That bolt was completely missing, gone, fell off the car, so I just put that bolt in. And if you can see this one over here, that was the original one that was in there too. Bolt, the nut for it, completely gone. Everything completely missing. How that did not fall off, how the gasket didn't fall out completely, I have no freaking idea, but uh, yeah, somehow this bolt stayed without having a nut attached to it. I have no idea how that's even possible, but it, uh, it works somehow. So yeah, I'm gonna replace them both with these big boy ones with extra double washers, extra lock nuts, and hopefully this doesn't happen again. All right guys, so I got the new bolts on here. Let's go under. So there's the big boy bolt. That's just barely fits in the holes. That's so unlike the ones that came with it. That's a massive bolt. Put lock washers on both sides of it. And this one here, I put another. Um, I think this was a 14 millimeter, like it came with. Now it's a little longer than it's supposed to be, but again, I put locks like you can see on both sides here. Uh, that's what those little serrated teeth are to make sure it doesn't back back out. And I used a heavy duty impact on it, so if it backs out again. I don't know, we've got some serious other issues to worry about. But I just wanna check, cause it's only got two bolts there. How are these ones doing up here? Those are all right. That one over there's okay. Now we've got three bolts back here that all have not moved an inch. Super freaking weird that the other one had moved like that. I don't understand why, cause these ones haven't moved at all. Very, very weird, but hey, as long as it's still good, I'm happy. I know this video has a bunch of stuff going on it. We've worked on the MR2 here, fixed the, uh, fixed the lights on it. We put a strut bar on this. We fixed the exhaust and now we're back to the MR2 again. One last thing for this video. Um, the car has had boost creep as of recently and I think it's been going on for quite some time. I don't know if this is going to fix it or not. Uh, it's going to help my OCD a little bit and the fact that it's going to clean some things up. But the TVSV, which, pretty much limits the boost when the car's cold. So when the car's cold, it limits the amount of boost pressure that you get. Um, so you're not, well, over boosting the car when it's dead cold and running like 17 PSI like you can with a manual boost controller. You're supposed to unplug it and then cap it. I've left it unplugged. Now looking into it, it looks like it's actually vacuum source based. So vacuum source goes into the like little controller and I guess at a certain PSI, a certain amount of boost, it adds vacuum or removes vacuum. Uh, so it keeps the boost down to a certain amount or level, kind of like a Mac valve works, right? It works just kind of like a Mac valve in a certain way. Um, so say the spring inside there is a eight PSI spring. With it on, it allows it to go up to like 17 PSI. With it off, it stays down at that eight PSI. So it kind of works like a Mac valve in a way. Um, so what I'm gonna do is remove that Hoping that gets rid of the issue. I'm also going to remove the manual boost control and just run a line directly from the turbo to the wastegate itself, eliminating the boost control altogether. See if my manual boost controller is messed up. And if I'm still seeing 17, 18 PSI, we know it's the boost controller itself, or not the boost controller, but the wastegate itself then, meaning that it's either sticking or it's having a problem. My understanding is it's only two bolts that bolt onto it, and then there's one in the back where it actually actuates. Um, I'm told it's not that hard to remove, but I might have to do that for another video. For now, we're just going to remove the TVSV, and I'll show you where that's at. Alright guys, see that little blue controller right there? That is your TVSV switch. So, you can see the little plug there going into it. I need to unplug that, and then you can see a vacuum hose here that's running the whole way up and across. That ran up to the turbo before, and then there's one in the back, which I need to trace and see where it goes, because I kind of want to cap that off at its main source too, and just get this out completely. You can see it's only held in with two 10 millimeter bolts, so I'd rather just cap it completely and be done with it. Uh, if not, it's not a big deal, but I just think that would be a lot easier. All right, finally got that out. Uh, I had to do a couple little fixes, but I'm not really sure where the vacuum line goes exactly because I wanted to remove everything, but with the way these cars are and the way everything is, when I go to drop the motor here eventually, uh, I think I'm just gonna mess with it then and you know delete everything like I'm going to, put the turbo kit on it, do all that stuff. I found a couple of the oil leaks. It's actually coming from the factory catch can 
and then a couple other spots. But again, when I do the whole gasket replacement, I'll go over this entire trans. I'll do everything on that bad boy and take care of that. But here's the sensor that I removed. This is your TVSV, as it's called it. I, yeah, it's pretty much like, it, it's not a Mac valve, but it is. So it uses a boost reference or uses vacuum reference to send um, reference to the actual uh, wastegate itself then it has a reference for vacuum and this limits the turbo um, until it's warmed up pretty much so until you reach whatever a certain temp I think the wastegate spring in them is say I think 8 psi uh, this uh, is turned off and then once the car warms up this turns on holds the wastegate shut a little bit longer and lets you I think reach 12 psi now when you do a manual boost controller guys run 15 16 17 psi max but you need to get rid of this or cap off the piece um, today, I just went ahead and decided, you know, let's go ahead and remove the entire piece uh, before it gets damaged anymore. It might be worse. I mean, someone might actually want it. So figure to take it off, have the bolts. If someone's looking for it, let me know. You pay shipping. This is yours. Uh, if someone truly needs it, uh, if you're going to take it to resell it, you can eat a dick. <laughs> but if you truly need it to help your car, if there's something you need, guys, let me know. Uh, you can have it. I don't, I want to try some help someone out in the community. But let me get under the car here and show you how I capped it off. I actually use a bolt in the vacuum line with some, ugh, let me get under here. Good Lord, I'm getting fatter and fatter. All right guys, so you can see this vacuum line here. That was the one that went underneath of the TVSV and that was your reference that went directly to the turbo. You can see how it snakes down and over and that went over to the wastegate for the turbo. Then this other line here, which you can see a janky zip tie, a bunch of goo it looks like, and a bolt. That is a vacuum source coming from the manifold. So I went ahead and did is put a OEM bolt that I had that fit inside of there, use a ton of Toyota FIPG, which is a sealant type, and a big zip tie. The reason for doing this is to make sure it, I don't have any vacuum leaks. I couldn't find the exact source and I didn't feel like digging with it today. This is a quick and easy way for me to let it dry here, turn the car on, make sure I have no vacuum leaks. And then once the snow goes away, I'll be able to test it and make sure everything's okay. You can see the plug just dangling there also. There are so many plugs unplugged on this engine, it is unreal. There's probably no joke, 12 or 13 plugs just dangling. That's why I wanna get this out, get the new Link ECU in it, get a custom harness for this car, clean everything up and make it look the way it should. On top of it, fix all the oil leaks. Look, look at this. This is absolutely atrocious. I bought the car this way and it does bother me, guys. But there's no point in trying to do little fixes when I'm going to yank the motor and fix it all at once. All right, guys, so now we have the boost control there. Now, I'm going to, before I remove this, because it's such a pain in the butt to get it out, I have it sitting down there tight for a reason. Before I remove it, what I'm going to do is, I'm actually going to leave it there, drive the car around, and see if I still get the spike issue. If I'm still getting that spike, then I want to remove that boost control, run a line directly from the turbo here, over to the wastegate right here, run one direct line, so it'll only run wastegate pressure. Now, if I'm still spiking, there's no if, ands, or buts about it, guys, the wastegate will be junk then. That means it's, it's not opening properly, it's not bleeding off enough, uh, air like it should be or exhaust that it should be so we'll know that's the issue and that just means I need a new wastegate or it needs to be rebuilt my understanding is it's only two bolts on the front and then one bolt on the back that actually act actuates the flap uh, so hopefully that is the actual problem uh, if it isn't I don't think I'm really going to dig into more since I'm going to throw this all away or I should say throw away I'm going to sell it all um, update it fix it all and then sell it because uh, I'm going to that new turbo system and on no that note, guys, I am done today. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, I hope you guys are enjoying this content here, lady. Lately, uh, man, I can't even talk today. Uh, I'm gonna be doing another informational video on both of these cars here. There's a new MR2 coming out, and I kinda wanna give some background on that. And there's also a new FRS that is coming here down the line, which I'm kind of excited about. Um, some of the renderings are cool, but we don't even know what it's going to look like, but it is coming. Uh, kinda excited to see that if there's a new MR2, and I'm, I'm pretty pumped that Toyota is actually giving us new stuff. Uh, I talked to Robert there. The turbo kit should ship this week. So if you don't see it by Sunday's upload, you guys will see it by the following Thursday's upload when I get it installed uh, or show you guys what's in the kit first. And then after that, I'll show an install video of putting it in the car and then first startup. All right, guys, thank you very much. Do me the big favor, go down below, give this a big like. And also, if you could comment, let me know what you guys think of the content here lately. Also, one last favor, go check out the Pure Function website. I've got all sorts of new stuff on there, hats, shirts, t-shirts, hoodies, you name it, I got it. Thank you very much, and I'll talk to you later. Peace.